Hello and welcome. I wish to start this talk by having us honor the inherent human desire to understand and also to be understood. Uh, listening today are many different souls who might be nervous, elated, curious, apathetic, or even angry about the topics that are gonna be discussed. I'm glad for each person that's listening today. Please think for a second about how you're feeling and give yourself permission to feel that way. Realize that others here may be feeling a similar way. Just sit for a minute with how our lives brought us here to this moment. There is sacredness in this togetherness. In this talk today, I am uh, going to describe a bit about my journey with uh, the spirit of civic mindedness, which will provide more context to the question of why listen to me, why not somebody else? My perspective is a result of a unique path in life, which allows me to share a message that I believe to be incredibly useful at the current moment. From a place of privilege, I chose to attack substantial suffering with the careers that I chose, first as a paramedic, then as an emergency manager, specializing in weapons of mass destruction and public health. Throughout my career, I've also conducted a personal study of comparative religion to better understand the ways humans combat suffering in the world. So my path has been one that has been spiritual yet simultaneously in alignment with science. I've applied this back, this grounded approach to study uh, three human fault lines, which is uh, racism, sexism, and caste. And I have adapted or created original diagrams and concepts that convey the realizations that I've made along the way, which I will share with you today and which are based on the foundation of a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge and teachings from others along my journey. This is the first of my three pronged approach to reducing suffering in the world through what I call a two quit talk. The second talk involves reconciling the many conflicting world religions and the third talk relates to improving government with quality and social responsibility. By the end of this first talk though, I hope you'll see what I see about our freedom relying on our careful gardening of the seeds of the collective civic spirit. All right, so we are currently in what I call a civility war. We are polarized along many visceral vices and virtues with a tendency towards tribalism that makes us only more isolated to the point that it's even stalled our lawmakers. We need to unify around a set of principles and then let science and reason guide us towards the right action by those principles and then unify behind it while continuing to maintain a healthy skepticism always. We need to do this as a collective instead of as a bunch of angry bigots slinging misinformation pushed on them by biased 0.1 percenters, the ultra rich, who profit from our country being in chaos. Fortunately, this is what science does. It maintains a healthy skepticism by forming a hypothesis and then trying to prove that hypothesis wrong. The real division in this country is not over left versus right, black versus white, or any form of good versus bad. It's actually about science versus slander or truth versus bias. When people argue and act based on their biases, we fall into three groups. <clears throat> the resilient, the unacting, and the uncaring. The uncaring are pessimists, though they usually think of themselves as realists. They look at the ugliness of the world and are so overwhelmed by it that they lose hope that a better world is even possible. So they only look out for themselves and their households. Worse, the uncaring are inclined to believe the worst rumors and see the world as even worse than it actually is, a disease called negativity bias. The mental state of the uncaring is what I call hell. The unacting, on the other hand, are idealists, though they think of themselves as optimists. These types react to the ugliness of the world by pretending the ugliness isn't real. They might call it a boundary, and boundaries are important, don't get me wrong about that, but it's actually an alternate reality in which they spend 99% of their time. While only some of the unacting deny of problems of the world, they are definitely debilitating the solutions by their desire for false security and emotional peace at all costs. You might've guessed it, my term for the emotional state of these minimizers is heaven. Like a drug-induced dream world, it is not good for us. 
One manifestation of such minimizing is addiction, whether to sex, drugs, rock and roll on TV, or other methods that reduce our emotional response instead of recognizing and reacting to real problems. Second is a minimizer who spits toxic positivity, a brand of pseudoscientific energy transference and positive vibes only mentality that gaslights and alienates activists. Pos toxic positivity folks seek affirmation and reassurance that the system is just in order to justify their inaction and all the benefits they gain from that system. So they sit, they keep us all sitting in fact, collectively like a frog in boiling water, is how I describe it. The greatest trick used by those who wish to maintain their power and the status quo, this greatest gaslighting involves exploiting our inclination towards deference and protection by an authoritative and usually white male leader. Religions especially encourage us to believe in some Lord, God, or similar fictitious white man in the sky. Not only are there agents of Russia and other adversaries among us using these tactics, but our own government agencies, sometimes covert operatives are instigating addiction, toxic positivity and gaslighting within our countercultures and activist circles as a tactic to quell resistance and rebellion. Look up the MK Ultra and the MK Often programs and look how Timothy Leary back in the 70s was able to pass as part of a progressive movement and sell us this phony counterculture motto of turn on, tune in, and drop out. These adversaries go further, sabotaging relationships and uh, by uh, activist relationships to alienate us from the support networks that we need, which is among the reasons why activists are slow to trust, extremely insular, and suspicious of outsiders and their ideas. Too few activists are willing to declare war on these tactics, especially upon religion, or perhaps that they just don't get very far when they do. With my lifelong study of religion and resistance uh, and resilience, I consider myself reasonably well suited to carry the message further than I found it anyway, or what's at least far enough for others uh, that will, they will consider it far uh, further than they've been. And I've had to try. My next talks lay out my concerns with the major world religions. But in this one, I merely intend to point out the association to help explain what I feel I have to contribute to this resistance. All right, in my first book, I discussed culture and counterculture. However, I've more recently come to understand in our movement for freedom, I see it as a microcosm of five separate separate spheres of influence. And I find the, the ability to influence others extends just one culture either way. The greed is good corporatists and swindlers who use any means necessary for personal gain, find common ground with extremist fascist groups and also with the common conservative or moderate as they call themselves nowadays. The common, excuse me, conservative idolizes the pro-business corporatists and also identifies with the pro-policing elements of more reluctant progressives. The reluctant progressives side with neoconservatives from their fear of not maintaining rule of law and also identify with some of the reforms called for by activist groups. Activist groups currently bear the burden of coaxing the other four towards progress, but only really have any influence on timid liberals. The spheres of influence loop back again when Radicalized fascists, uh, when like radicalized fascists, activists can be radicalized towards extremism under the shared common ground of believing that violence is justified to disrupt the status quo. The approach for influencing each culture must be tailored to that particular culture, whether it's de radicalizing extremists, improving union participation, educating about equity in economics, or simply engaging in activism. Additionally, at least some of the change agents and change leaders study change management, if you are not familiar with these terms, uh, should be people who are easily identifiable as being from a sphere that is adjacent to the target audience. What I mean is, don't use Black Lives Matter leaders to try to influence police and other racism deniers. 
and expect it to work anyway. Also don't expect any liberal to have any sway with the Trumpers of the world. Underlying all these approaches is the general need for greater civic mindedness all around. It's just a theory of mine, but I believe our society would be better if people place more value on activities that matter and less on frivolous entertainment. Since we don't though, it has become a public health crisis that requires a grassroots solution driven by local government, one that empowers civic engagement of all citizens through activism podcasts, book clubs, civics podcasts, and dialogue or debate clubs, what I call the ABCDs of civic-minded spirit. This is where we get into my story, which is to help fill what I see as a large gap in our civic duty to dialogue and to do it right. The old adage is don't talk politics or religion. The result of that mindset is we have forgotten how to discuss politics and religion in a healthy way with someone further to one side of the spectrum or even with someone further on the same side of the spectrum. I've dabbled more than a bit in dialogue from, about both and what I have to share is a technique I call HIP which stands for heal, inform, progress. If there is one thing that we should be able to agree on, it's that we all have to start to heal. Attacking and shaming others doesn't work. There are already enough people trying that and look where that's gotten us. So I modified the HIP technique from CF MOP, uh, my first signature kind of system, which stood for connection, fears, myths, obstacles, and progress, a system I described in my first book. I chose the term because CF would appeal specifically to emergency responder types who know it stands for clusterfuck and MOP being something that would clean that up. From my emergency response and consulting work, I've learned how not to shy away from critical conversations that involve carefully guiding people to in inconvenient truths. As a medic, you may have only a few minutes to connect with your patients and their loved ones, but it is easier for me to have hard conversations with patients when I was operating from a position of authority. Dialogue is much more difficult without the referral power that comes from holding that position of authority on a matter. Humans survive by the information we learn from people we trust, parents, grandparents, teachers, employers, public officials. These teachers though got their information from their parents, grandparents, teachers, employers, public officials who got it from theirs and so on and so on, a game of Chinese whispers going on for thousands of years. I argue that we have a responsibility to our teachers, not only to keep teaching, but to cons constantly question and constantly dialogue. One of the things I've found through my dialogue coaching sessions is that it takes more than one statement or even an hour to properly work through these important differences of opinion, beliefs, and facts. It is a myth that we can work through these topics matter of factly because it takes time to listen and understand and uh, and to help others feel understood. We all have the desire to be understood, yet don't completely understand ourselves. We all have blind spots and shadows, and while we can't defeat them through shame, pity does work. People handle pity better than shame because pity allows people to admit their error without crushing their ego with guilt. So pity is a vehicle for delivering truth while upholding the individual's need for safety, basic needs, belonging, esteem. Pity focuses on the wrong idea without making the person think there is something wrong with them or even, there, even though there might be. Pity is a means of granting generous interpretations and dialogue and therefore reciprocity, therefore reciprocally causes others to grant generosity in return. So what, what I started working to do was bring civility to the interpersonal level where trust resides and have dialogue together rather than debate about the three biggest fault lines. To do that, I had to gain mastery of them myself. I studied very hard and although our learning about equality is endless, I eventually came to be one kind of a leader on these subjects. Recording lessons I've learned from my many uncomfortable conversations, I've defined a five-step process of critical conversations and described five strategies I incorporate into my civic dialogue about race, gender, and caste which I provide free of charge to anyone who asks about them. So can't reach out. Few people handle criticism well. Often we see it as attacking or belittling, belittling whether it actually does or not. These are fault lines because these touch upon core values. And frankly, most of us are misguided in our value system in some way or another. So criticism on these topics, even when given compassionately, 
seems belittling, which is why it requires the subject uh, participants in the dialogue to show up with great courage and vulnerability. With vulnerability, along with a little civility, courage, and truth, self-improvement can occur. This definition of civility emphasizes the importance of not dehumanizing or degrading someone else in these kinds of conversations. All right, I feel it's important to show a few faces other than mine. Uh, here are some human beings doing the difficult inner work and outer work to help on these issues. First up is Christian Picciolini, uh, is a former white power movement leader who's written about his descent into white supremacy and then how he got out. I've attended a talk of his back in 2015 after he had just released his first book. And I assert that practically all public safety workers need to seek assistance from this organization, lifeafterhate.com. Uh, next, uh, Brené Brown, uh, a leading researcher, writer, speaker on courage, vulnerability, empathy, and shame. Brené asserts, ideological bunkers protect us from everything except loneliness and disconnection. In other words, we're not protected from the worst heartbreaks of all. I've read five of her books and listened to many of her talks, and we all should. All right, Daryl Davis is a subject of a documentary called Accidental Courtesy, and he's the author of a book, Clandestine Relationships, about how he's helped over 200 Klansmen give up their robes. One of the things he's imparted on me in a couple of conversations is you cannot beat the hate out of a hateful person. And then lastly is my Mimi, my grandma, uh, a great parent and spouse raising four children, taking in three grandchildren in her 50s and standing by my grandfather in his fight with cancer. She lives with the mindset that we are inherently good and must help each other get through this tough world together. She tells me nothing makes a parent more proud than seeing their kids and grandkids care for each other and for others. When she talks about her kids and grandkids, she says, I taught them everything they know. And from supporting them all those years, she is a self-proclaimed teacher, soldier, pilot, truck driver, attorney, paramedic, and more. She refers to herself as a country bumpkin, yet also explains that if I were prejudiced, I would not have had the blessing of meeting all those people when referring to the diverse friends whose lives she's touched just by showing an interest in their language and in their customs. There is a fear that not having a degree makes one less dignified or less worthy. And this fear causes resentment of others, which is often motivated by race, gender, and caste. But my Mimi is a testament that it, if there's love in one's heart, there's no room for resentment. I discuss my own grandmother here because I feel it's important that we recognize that these hard conversations are being had with loved ones and very much capable of producing deep pain. So my challenge to each of you is to leave here with a greater understanding of the people with viewpoints unlike yours. You can do that via what Brené Brown calls strong back, soft front, wild heart. Strong back means we have a firm commitment to truth. From the fire service, I learned how to be a master storyteller and a bullshitter. I use to utilize pseudoscience with patients sometimes, like injecting them with normal saline and telling them it would reduce their pain. But when it comes down to our fault lines and the state of our democracy, we cannot mess around. Soft front speaks to our openness to the possibility of being wrong, which can bring anger and guilt and cause us to blame or accuse others. It means approaching the discussion with a mindset that we might learn something from another instead of the idea that we have something to teach or prove to another. Wild heart is to me the hardest because it's the rule that is most important when the conversation is most tense. It involves listening to understand, allowing time to let the psychological charge from the last comment ease away and responding in a way that is compassionate. When we say something that it is in violation of truth or civility, which happens, we have to then have the vulnerability to return with civility and apologize properly. The apology is as much for our healing from our mistake than it is for the healing of the other person. These are the unwritten rules that we need to abide by if we're to be courageous and compassionate enough to keep control of our democracy. Uh, and there's group exercises that will help us in this. While I have no certifications in psychology, I explained how my investigating approach to life, yep, I am an Enneagram 5, has caused me to seriously study both spirituality and science. 
Another who has formed a special bond between spirituality and science is the Dalai Lama. And when he met Aaron Beck, the founder of cognitive behavioral therapy, his holiness referred to the social sciences as still childlike. And I agree. In recent decades, the Dalai Lama has worked to advance the sciences, helping for one, to produce a map of human emotions. I applaud his challenge to psychology's emotion wheel. However, I'm still unsatisfied with the map that he created. Here is my proposed alternative in this slide, which clarifies the relationships between the emotions in a way that is better at reducing suffering and improving our discussions of the fault lines, because it points to an underlying cause of the emotion as either a reflection of a physical, social, or mental need unmet. The emotions highlighted in red are the major negative ones, which we must do our best to address when they're only minor negatives. In doing so aids us in our coming discussion of the fault lines. Before we get into that though, I have a short exercise um, to help us with civility um, by helping us focus on what we have in common. So if you're listening to this remotely, please put your fist in the air if you have felt the wind at the top of a mountain. Remember, this is just us finding common ground. Eventually, we're all going to have our hands in the air. Have watched the color shift of a sunset. Have experienced the smell of a skunk. Have a favorite musician. Have been in an ambulance. Have had surgery. Have had the flu. Have lost a favorite pet. Have lost a loved one have worried for humanity or for our planet. So if you could see others listening to this talk, you would see them with their fists in the air, just like you. You can put your fists down now. When it comes to the most important things in life, we all share them together. All right, uh, so this is a, you know, think about that togetherness when we run into that, uh, that difficulty in discussing with somebody. All right, so let's delve into the dialogues of the fault line the fault lines. The first one is race. For each of the fault lines, I'm going to share a bit about my story and about my journey and about what I've learned because I have not only the, an opportunity but an obligation to use my privilege and perspective to help improve on this problem. Growing up, I heard you know, rumors once in a while about so-and-so being a clan member. Yet I was brought up in my own bubble of coal country to treat all equally, though I didn't, I didn't know near enough about what it meant until much later. I just happened to live in the same trailer park as some of the only black kids in my school, so they were naturally among my best friends, though my friends group was still almost entirely white, and so were our group norms. I recall a story my Mimi told a couple times about her dad being saved in a mine collapse by a voice that was identifiably black saying, I've got you, Roscoe. My grandfather used to say, in the mines, we're all black. In college, I chose a racially diverse Baltimore and I became a first responder, believing somewhat in the righteousness of all public safety officials. I held that belief longer than I should have. I used to nod or maybe even chuckle uncomfortably when I heard the cops talk about their encounters and their justifications for force. like. You've got to teach them a lesson so they learn not to resist. Or when I see a gun or even think I see a gun, I shoot. It's called suicide by cop. My objection to public safety culture was mostly in my good example only, uh, instead of necessarily speaking up about wrongs like that. Uh, at least until I was voted onto the board of directors of my firehouse, at which time I did sponsor a revision to our company ethics policy and renewed effort to enforce it, uh, ex spe uh, specifically expressing concerns about how we handled what is often just seen as just a joke. But to be honest, naive me didn't realize how troublesome a problem racism in the United States was and, and how police acted above the law so comfortably, at least not until the fall of 2014 when the United Nations made a statement condemning our police brutality problem after riots about our lack of justice and the murder of the unarmed Michael Brown by the police and a string of related injustices by police that were getting video recorded. I witnessed my black friends 
at this time, starting to resign from activities and groups with white cultural norms. I would see their pain in their statements and in their eyes and in their children's eyes. I would hear these loved ones desperately share what they were experiencing and plead, where are all my white friends? Where are their voices? That's when the white guilt set in, disturbing my sleep and my productivity for months. I used to use phrases like, when did you see it and what took so long to challenge others, uh, other white people anyway, to awaken to it as well. In doing so, I was suggesting myself as someone they could talk to about the shame and what it's like to realize we've been blind to such a problem and uh, so a problem that's so completely opposite of who we thought we were as human beings, who we thought our parents and teachers were and who we thought we were as a country. It would be years before friends would actually start their journey and consult me. Worsening race-based attitudes in my federal government workplace was also a part of what caused me to stop doing that work after about a year under Trump. And I began a new phase of my life attempting to be an activist and community organizer, though being met with a lot of mistrust, understandably. So I wanna highlight some of what I learned from uh, two people on this path. I had the pleasure of chatting with a couple times with Daryl Davis, as I mentioned, and among the wealth of wisdom uh, that Daryl shares was uh, a story that's personal to him. Um, coming to the defense of a, the wife of a firefighter who was beaten by her husband and how he helped her fight for justice in the face of, of it being covered up by her husband's police friends. And that is absolutely how public safety culture works. And I know because we covered for each other as, as medics. And it's absolutely the opposite of accountable public services. And it's the opposite of a world in which I wish to live. That case is good reason for me uh, to, to you know, strongly believe that we must end qualified immunity that protects folks in the criminal justice system from being held accountable for their actions. Daryl also makes a strong case for being pro-cop but anti-corruption. As he explains it, there's three types of police, good, bad, and honest. A good cop is a quiet cop, and an honest cop is run out of the department. I absolutely agree with that. He believes that most police want to be honest, but jurisdictions don't implement anonymous reporting of police brutality, nor implement independent and public investigation into it, which would restore public belief in police. Instead of doing the difficult duty of ensuring justice, we see them take the easy path of deflecting, knowing that they will get away with it because the public isn't organized enough to seek justice for themselves. They hide behind the bad apples argument. When we put bad behaviors in a box and label it bad apples, it deceives us into thinking that we aren't complicit in a systemic problem because we aren't bad apples. The simple fact is that while police culture cares about protecting the people in the communities it serves, it cares more about protecting itself. And this is evident to me in how quickly some of my friends have come to defend this bad policing instead of condemning it as an insult on the well-meaning men and women in uniform and an insult to our form of government and allied citizens. So by my anti-racism efforts, I also met a man by the name of Aaron Goggins, who is co-founder of the Black Lives Matter DC chapter, and an intellectual who is a thought leader in the BLM movement. Like many in BLM, he started out believing victimized people should not be the ones to have to change. And that makes sense. He's honest about his inclination. Um, he's honest that his inclination for a while was just to do damage to the current system. Uh, you know, what's described as our anarchism. Usually whites are not welcomed into Black Lives Matter space. However, Aaron has been one who has pushed back on this some and has um, you know, gone through the personal uh, sacrifice of joining forces with non-Black individuals and creating a course called Liberation Logic that aimed to help white, mostly white participants understand and overcome their inner, inner personal organizational and systemic racism. I attended the second offering of this workshop and I also attended his fourth offering to which Aaron expanded his ideas beyond just a discussion of race to emphasize caste, sexism and all the isms really. Aaron's workshops introduced me to the 15 characteristics of white supremacy culture which is an article that you can look up and I recommend it. And uh, he also introduced me to how freedom elevates both the oppressor and the oppressed, which you can read more about in The Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. Aaron spoke to 
the goal of nonviolent revolution and how it requires inner evolution and unlearning of ingrained relationships with power. Recognizing the full extent of, of their oppression and remaining nonviolent makes just about every Black American one of the most morally upright individuals in society for the persecution that they managed to withstand and still find joy and love for others and survive. The impacts of slavery don't just live on terrorizing our black peers in the new Jim Crow system described in, uh, by Michelle Alexander in her book of the same name, but the traumas last generations as Dr. Joy DeGru articulates in her book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Never forget or take for granted that we haven't seen more crime and violence toward our oppressors though it has been justified and how much of a testament that is to the incredible fortitude, restraint and inner power of black Americans. Aaron though is on another level with his analysis and leadership of anti-racism. His liberation logic workshop presented three essential tools to nonviolent revolution worth mentioning. First, self-awareness. It's the recognition that one's talents and also one's blind spots require uh, inner work. The second tool he emphasizes in the workshop is mutuality, a principle that interpersonal interaction must reflect the need for diversity and optimize the talents and blind spots of the group. Third, co-creation is a commitment to working together to find solutions where the needs of all parties like freedom can be met rather than just the needs of the majority or the dominant group. All of us, but especially police need weekend workshops like this in our lives on a regular basis. So since we cannot devote an entire day to discussing anti-racism, although I have been known to do so, here is a summary of the fears, myths, and obstacles involved and some progress being made. First fear, and here let's notice the common ground. Both police and black Americans fear for their safety and for their ability to continue to provide for their families. When you want to give up in a discussion about police brutality, try coming back to that shared humanity. Next. Fewer cops will be willing to protect and serve without qualified immunity. I have had police friends tell me this outright and I kind of find it appalling because it shows their disregard for uh, the, the disregard that the criminal justice workers have for justice, doesn't it? There is truth in it though. And I find it completely possible that coming police reforms are going to be met with opposition from police unions in the form of police strikes. But in the best case scenario, there's going to be a drop off in the number of police on the streets as police undergo any change. And this is already occurring. However, given the never ending pull of applicants for police departments, quantity isn't as much of an issue as equality or as quality. And it's not an issue to me because I've relinquished myself from the illusion of total safety some time ago at the highest at their highest staff, police response times were about five minutes. Knowing what I know, I still argue that response time, um, still argue that for the response time to go up, uh, if that's what is required to ensure public safety works for all, not just some, uh, not one of us are safe unless all of us are safe. And as, act, as, as activists, we say, no justice, no peace. Back to fears, okay. Uh, white people, please stop playing the victim. Sure, it fits our Western mindset that there is a victim and a villain in every story, but our tendency to vilify, also we, we tend to blame individuals for systemic problems, whereas the culture of domination goes back before a recorded time. I know it's easier to believe another group is inferior than to believe our grandparents and ancestors left us such an oppressive system, um, but this may be the most important thing for us uh, in order to fix our race-based struggle. White fragility is a name for this. And also whites, please address this fear that if systemic racism is real, your status in society is unearned because it is somewhat. And I know you get comfort from the idea that you're more deserving and that's why you excelled in life or that you're just getting by in life when others aren't. Um, but the comfort you have, uh, still you have a comfort that no matter how bad things get, at least you aren't black. And yeah, that's, that's what I call privilege addiction. 
And I'm speaking of it because I know more of us recognize this than will admit it. And the fear of losing it is another obstacle to us overcoming racism. Myths. Uh, I think we all know Black Lives Matter doesn't mean only Black Lives Matter. Some of us just like to argue to feel better about ourselves. Law and order does not work equally for everybody. Therefore, it does not deserve the faith we put in it. All right, uh, black on black crime is a real problem, but uh, and Black Lives Matter is working against gun violence, such as through the ceasefire program in Chicago. Uh, I lived and served as a medic in Elijah Cummings' seventh seventh congressional district in Maryland, which is famously bad crime statistics. And I can declare that it is poverty that is truly to blame and must be fixed. Half a century of underfunding social services has created an intergenerational poverty that has more greatly affected those who are simultaneously battling systemic racism. I'd like to think we are in the process of replacing the war on drugs with a, with a war on poverty that provides a safety net that actually helps th others thrive and reach our full potential and not just survive. <clears throat> Next myth. Um, those who say more whites are killed by police are stubbornly twisting statistics to fix their argument. Because whites interact mostly with whites and blacks mostly with blacks, most crime occurs among people of the same race. But 40% of police murders are black males who make up only 6% of the population. With body cam footage, we are seeing many instances where black Americans are killed under conditions which whites would not have been killed. All right, this last myth I have to mention is a big reason why I put little faith in police. There are people, many of them police and judges too, who have forgotten that in this country, people are innocent until proven guilty. This means alleged criminals have a right to judgment by a judge and jury of their peers instead of a bullet in the back as they flee what is undoubtedly an unjust justice system in this country. Further, we have the right to resist unlawful arrest with minimal harm, upheld by John Bad Elk versus the US in except the states that violate this precedent with their penal code. But to anyone who says, if you don't want shot, don't commit a crime, like some of the cops I know, you should firmly reply that you uphold the constitution and the punishment has to fit the crime. If you have any questions about why any of these are myths, feel free to email me and I'll be happy to elaborate and share some resources with you. So we talked about the need to break the bad apples box already. And another obstacle is the large number of citizens who have distrust of government and government officials to even fix this and other public health problems. I've talked with several anarchists who know of many atrocities the US government and its agents have committed over the first couple hundred years of our country. And they know that the private sector is even less accountable. So the only remaining alternative for them is anarchy and what's called game B alternative living. Anarchy, however, does not replace the need for resolution of societal problems, nor does it help bring resolution outside of increasing public awareness of those problems. Progress in terms of racial justice indeed does involve inciting public awareness and activism at a critical mass to ensure government action. Many now are recognizing the problem finally, including some police, more veterans I talk to, some churches, and even major companies and public facing organizations like the National Basketball Association are making very public statements. Aside from that, the onus really rests on justice organizations to do the hard job and properly address race-based crimes, starting with those who work in criminal justice. Internationally, uh, resource sharing and standard setting is done by the Geneva Center for Democratic Control of Armed Forces, DCAF, which maintains a police integrity toolkit and the International Association of Chiefs of Police, which promotes police accountability through citizen review. Domestically, the American Civil Liberties Union does the brunt of the legal work defending police uh, abuse victims and their families, while Black Lives Matter has done incredible grassroots lobbying and can, can claim responsibility for wider use uh, of police body cameras, partly by encouraging citizen video recording of police encounters and their cop watch program. Citizen review is an important component of accountability, but our policing will not truly be just until we elevate the requirements of police to ensure that people with the license to kill are leaders in their communities on the subject of empathy and equity. This is what I mean when I say defund the police, because I know that if we held police to this standard, 
99.99% wouldn't cut it. COVID would fare better against Lysol than cops fare against empathy standard. Prove me wrong. All right, so other uh, books and talks of mine convey my analysis about the relationships of race and gender and the social context of my story of humanity. But here I'm just going to highlight a bit about my story and journey with our next fault line, gender. Again, using my privilege to take on some of the inconvenient truths about the fault lines. If I've adhered mostly to the ways of a good man, it was because of my upbringing by a devoted single mother who finished school and became a teacher with a master's degree, now an ed while raising a child. My mother is a beautiful example of a woman who, with the aid of public assistance, improved the life of her son and herself, and then went to work in education so that she could lift others up and uh, contribute to the betterment of others and show valuable impact of working women in our society. Her path was in many ways a contrast to the life led by her mother, my wonderful Mimi, who held occasional jobs, but over a passion for nursing, chose the primary duty of raising children. And then for a time, a grandchild, me, and for a longer time, three grandchildren. So in short, I was raised recognizing that the role of women in society was undergoing a transformation. Yet what I hardly understood was that at stake in this change was the equal status and safety of women worldwide. <clears throat> Being a medic where I had women as peers, I started to better understand the battle women undergo to prove themselves in male dominated jobs. I also learned about gender by responding to reports of sexual and domestic violence. I never knew whether any of the miscarriages I had responded to involved domestic abuse, yet I sensed in many of these patients amid the sadness, a touch of relief that a child would not be born into an unstable situation. The male dominated firehouse culture though, still had a lot of transforming to do. It never failed that when a drunken subject call came out at the local college, somebody was gonna ask male or female. For a drunken female, you'd get more than one observer on the medic and maybe a whole engine crew would call available and come help us without being dispatched. First inside were the crusty old engine drivers. It was all harmless perhaps until you get a rape case and everyone was reminded how far male sliminess can go. For the men in the firehouse, the job required directness and toughness. So people who complained about their crudeness were deemed not suited for the job. Women on the team were called house honeys or badge bunnies. Since the old guard incorrectly presumed women to be doing the job for male attention, more than out of a conviction towards their mission. In the militarized and male dominated parts of the federal government where I worked, I noticed much of the same, except women's commitment was unquestionable. Non-male leaders in this realm had an uphill challenge to prove themselves to the good old boys in accordance with their not so good authoritative management styles and ideas about how a female should dress and conduct herself in the workplace. Often it involved women exerting pressure on other women to adhere to one set of ways or the other, the new or the old. These were the conditions I got fed up with, which ultimately helped me embrace the activist lifestyle, where I met more outspoken examples of female voices of empowerment. Through local talks and events, I learned about the fantastic work being done by the YWCA, for instance, though it was troubling to me that there were only about 200 YWCAs nationwide, despite there being thousands of YMCAs for males. I was moved by my interactions with Dr. LJ Samuel uh, of D local Washington, DC, who founded Cupid Sting, a local nonprofit aimed at supporting victims of harassment and violence against women. What struck me about Cupid Sting as much as the victims who shared their stories was that the main message was that women can choose not to be dainty, delicate, and dependent on men. And this to me ought to have been obvious in 2018 when I, when I met, uh, when Cupid Sting was founded, but ultimately it is not, and still isn't today. I really became wiser to women's struggle through my friend, Jameka Baker Flowers, author of Breaking Bitch, Dismantling the Lives to Reclaim Your Truth. Her book exposes the role of the entertainment industry in continuing, if not constructing these destructive gender norms. So the message that I wanna make loud and clear is that gender inequality is trauma, not just from incidents of harassment and rape that, that many fear constantly and have faced 
constantly, but also by being chronically forced to exist and to do everything in a patriarchy with little ability to change it. And no matter what way one looks, they see reminders of the rules decided only by men. Asked about this, many women will deny it because they either believe in sharing the only good vibes with you instead of their traumas, or because they prefer to avoid the thoughts of their oppression altogether, or both. But from my view, the women's movement intentionally pushes a, the barrier in bite-sized increments out of fear of blowback. The reason the patriarchy still exists has less to do with anything women do. It's more a reflection that not enough men have had their, have had their six and their demands for equality. We can do better, men. All right, about gender, most worth mentioning here is what I feel all men have to hear from the a call to, uh, from a group, an organization called A Call to Men. And we need to hear it repeatedly. For more than 20 years, A Call to Men has been working with men in colleges, professional sports, and military, teaching healthy, respectful manhood, and preventing violence against women, sexual assault, harassment, bullying, and many other social ills. A Call to Men CEO, Tony Porter, clarifies that he sees his work as preventative, calling men in instead of calling us out. What he and the A Call to Men team do call out is what, the, what they call the man box, similar to the bad apples box that we discussed uh, in our first fall line. In his talks, Tony and team show problems with the social construction creating pressure for men to be the opposite of women, whereby anything feminine is then looked down on and all male tenderness is scorned. They explain that this hurts men. While, while women are considered soft and delicate, men have been forced into the stark opposite of being tough and stoic, forced to refrain from basic comforts afforded to females. Tony says, the social construction begins with painting the room blue and gets reinforced with, which girl do you like? Questioning that encourages boys to see women as sexual conquests. I've heard Tony describe how the dehumanization of women is further propagated by pornography, movies, and music, like Eminem's Kill You, which has the following lyrics. Slut, you think I want, won't choke no whore till the vocal cords don't work in her throat no more? These motherfuckers are thinking I'm playing, thinking I'm saying the shit, because I think it just <laughs> to be saying it. Put your hands down, bitch. I ain't going to shoot you. I'm gonna pull you to this bullet and put it through you. Yeah, sorry, I, that's just not songs that I listen to. Uh, Tony shows that <laughs> marketed misogyny is also found in bro, cult, uh, bro country, like Luke Bryan's Country Girl Shake It For Me, or Blood Brothers, which goes, shooting bad booze out of Dixie cups, chasing every girl that wasn't fast enough. These country songs, by the way, led to the response from a female country artist like Maddie and Tay's Girl in a Country Song, and the song Soft Projects tune titled Time Up, Time's Up, and the Chicks song Goodbye Earl. Society has long demoralized the female. Nowadays we demoralize males and females, so I guess that's progress. All right, but the, the gender fault line, it has its fears, myths, obstacles, and progress being made just like the other fault lines, which you too can analyze for yourself here from this summary. The res these realizations are not my own, only the idea of summarizing them into this CF mop structure. So please pardon my mansplaining ladies because this part is directed at the guys. Guys who grew up with little sisters also be patient with me for this slide. For the rest of you, please follow along with an open mind. For females, there is often a fear of not having protection unless they utilize their feminine wiles to hook a guy who would die for us. Males, tend to have gender fears too. For us, there's often a fear of helplessness related to not being able to protect our loved ones from hurt and also a social pressure preventing us from being vulnerable, sharing emotion or domestic, doing domestic activities. A major myth for us all is that strength is merely musculoskeletal, ignoring the value of perseverance, courage, compassion as forms of strength. Our social construction, of gender leads most of society to believe that women's role is to be a soft and sweet submissive sexual being for her man and for a man that the difficulties of life are meant for him to bear only and for his wife to be shielded from with the exception of bearing his sexual burden. What the gender fault line comes down to is debunking that myth that separate societal expectations ought to exist for men and women. 
what a call to men calls breaking the man box. Aside from honoring all aspects of ourselves, whether society currently sees those aspects as male or female, an obstacle to gender progress is the struggle we have to have con courageous conversations about gender. This prevents us from overcoming another obstacle, which is the challenge of unlearning and breaking ourselves from established cultures, such as ingrained conduct and decorum in workplaces. One big example of this is tip culture, whereby many service workers like bartenders, food workers, hotel staff are not paid a sustainable wage on the premise that they will receive additional income based on the degree to which they can please a predominantly male clientele. So that needs to go. Some progress that is already occurring, however, is that women continue to outperform males in school and make incredible strides breaking glass ceilings in male dominated professions like the National Football League and the White House. <clears throat> Female firsts are great, yet we still have a long way to go until there is actually equal gender representation of employees, middle management, and executives of corporations, nonprofits, and all branches of government. Initiatives advancing the socioeconomic state of non-males are occurring through many, uh, through the work of many organizations like hashtag me too, he for she, and a call to men. Feel free to share in the comments of this video, which you support. All right, I'm gonna devote the most time to this third fault line, partially because I find it to be the most challenging and partly because the organizations in this fight are fewer and less powerful than, than they are for the first two fault lines. So what many of us call our socioeconomic class, I prefer to call CAST to align with what I learned from reading Isabel Wilkerson's book by the same name. CAST is absolutely intertwined with race and gender fault lines. Most of the time, I believe it is actually the preeminent one that contributes to the other two. So shortly, you will understand why. <clears throat> my understanding of CAST began with my upbringing in the declining coal and steel areas of rural Appalachia. I did well enough in school to have the option to leave the state and ultimately decided to pass on free in-state tuition to explore a new part of the country. The first step in escaping CAST is to seek out experiences different than one's own. So Baltimore, where I moved, was different. And as an emergency responder, I started to experience all of it. Homeless with uh, homeless people abusing medical services, less out of malice than for survival, um, overdoses galore, and the many effects of aging on the body. I was serving a variety of impoverished middle caste and upper caste families, and it made it apparent to me that injuries and illness are the great equalizers. In the fire service, I found much disdain for education, even worse than I did in coal country, really. In a culture where seniority is the modus operandi and the way we have always done it uh, is, is a mindset, young people face a battle in reaching their full potential. The fact that younger people are more inclined to keep up with rapidly advancing technology and other changes in emergency response services just further distances the youth from the older generations who fear that they will soon no longer be valued or able to earn income. My assessment is that this will soon no longer be valued, uh, be an issue. Uh, uh, my assessment is that this, this wicked generational warfare is a product of the pain of senior blue collar workers who feel inferior due to their lack of degrees that they probably wish they had yet find too difficult to get at this point in their lives. So they hate on education because they feel they can't themselves have it. The other side of the same coin is that often folks with degrees are still mediocre at what they do, which is how a young buck like me can come in and assess an organizations run by educated people and in a matter of weeks find ways to help the organization improve. Our education system is weak in my humble opinion, although this is becoming widely known, just not widely enough for us to demand our legislatures do something about it. <clears throat> Why would they, though, when those in power benefit from an ill-informed electorate? Those in power, aka Congress, like to profit from the discord that they create in government services, yet portray the passionate civil servants striving and sacrificing their wellness to provide services despite unfunded and underfunded mandates as, that, as, they're, as if they're the ones to blame. 
<clears throat> Congress's tentacles extend into every agency in the form of small frat-like circles of trust fund babies who got their degrees and job hardly because of talent and future potential demonstrated by their grit and ability to overcome obstacles, but because their surname is shared by somebody in Congress and the relative ease with which they go through life because of it. As you can imagine, my critical assessments of national security leadership and billion dollar government wide information systems software implementations also did not go over well with the those in the status quo either. I was even mocked for caring or tried uh, or trying to propose innovation. Higher levels only uh, uh, having higher levels only earned me more ridicule as I started to be met with harassment and even sabotage in my career. Because this kind of treatment is common, many civil servants buy their time until retirement, surrender to doing only what's minimally required to maintain their job, demoralized and even dehumanized. Whose fault really is it, the player or those who make the game? You decide, it's your government. So caste is at the heart of a deep division that has us uncivil and our lawmakers stalled. It has us blaming the poor for an economy that doesn't stand, that we don't stand a chance in with a minimum wage far below a livable wage and about 50% of us living paycheck to paycheck with no funds for eye, dental or medical appointments. I consulted my cousin recently about his finance after he just earned his GED. To retire by 70 and own a home by 35, he must make $3,000 a month which means a minimum wage earner like him needs to work two full-time jobs, which leaves no time for any hobbies or social life. And that was without a car, which, which he would likely need to get to his jobs. So his, his only one of hundreds of millions of Americans stuck in the cycle of socioeconomic disadvantage. The cycle starts with an individual in poverty, which, uh, which reduces their opportunities for work, which causes overwork which leads to substance abuse, which increases individual healthcare costs, all further contributing to that poverty. The poverty also leads to food insecurity, which leads to overeating and obesity, which both increase the healthcare spending and the poverty. And third, the poverty leads to dignity spending, which contributes to both the overeating and the substance abuse. And at the stem of the poverty is the reduced access to wellness care, which would snap the cycle at its root. So this economy has been rigged to favor the 0.1%, the people with immense inherited wealth who make a stupid amount of money just off the interest of the assets that they didn't earn. It got this way because we the people have let it. We've let our government become controlled by shadow banks and a small group of the world's most self-serving individuals. We've let our centralized bank, the Federal Reserve System, have financial controls that we have no visibility over of and to be privately owned by the people that we know nothing about, let alone whether they mock us behind our backs or we're, would even lose sleep if we starved to death or died from a disease. We have let the very people doing the economic abuse also do the regulating of the financial institutions. We've let them feed us lies like the law of attraction that attempts to blame ourselves for the financial situations forced upon us. We have let them define success by the value of our property instead of the value we provide to the lives of others. We have let them convince us that we benefit from the stock market growth that only worsens wealth inequality. We have let them mistakenly define principles for us like hedge fund billionaire Ray Dalio does in his book of the same, uh, of the same title, which happens to reveal his bastardization of the word meritocracy as he attempts to mask meritocracy under a false belief in private sector superiority. The statesman Confucius perhaps spoke first of meritocracy when he stated, in a country well governed, poverty is something to be ashamed of, but in a country badly governed, wealth is something to be ashamed of. So we just covered a lot, so let's summarize it. <clears throat> the poor, of course, have very pleasant fears about being unable to provide for the basic needs of their loved ones. But the more pressing issue to help us overcome our caste fault line is to address the fears of upper caste and stupidly upper caste about their unearned wealth and reduction of their life, uh, luxurious lifestyles, which is a form of what I call privilege addiction. To do so, we have to bust the myth that the poor just want to take what others have. 
That scarcity model is employed at the point one percenters use and not in the playbook of the people. No one wants to be a burden, depending on welfare or gambling uh, or other crime. Every human alive wants to be respectable, to reach their full potential, to add value to society and, and aspire to have private property later in life as a comfort and a reminder of their contribution to humanity. The second myth about caste I wanna highlight is that of private sector superiority where employees are expected to be grateful for the generosity of their merciful employers who through their intellect have allowed a fraction of the gains to trickle down to the economically enslaved workers who actually labored for the value gain. <clears throat> Competition under careful circumstances is useful. However, most of the time capitalism unchecked enables corporate waste, monopolies, racketeering, sometimes with involvement by government. In private-public partnerships, for instance, like those that exist in the criminal justice system, in healthcare and other industries, citizens' taxes are going straight to for-profit corporations led by executives and board members with eight-digit salaries who may not even work eight hours a week. On the third myth, don't be fooled. To blame are both political parties who are covertly working together and are in the process of suckering us into maintaining their power to force us into submission in another hundred years. Their next act is to magically boost the stock market with misinformation of the trillions in transportation funds about to flood large construction and materials companies through private public partnerships. So aside from overcoming the misinformation campaign that the 0.1% plays to fool us about its complete control of our government and our personal finances, we also have to defeat the lies of attraction and our desire to believe that we live in a meritocracy where earnings are actually vested to individuals based on their cognitive, analytical, psychomotor, and affective abilities, absent discrimination and evaluation bias. The biggest obstacle, perhaps, is breaking the deplorables box. The idea that shames poor people instead of recognizing how the 99.99% of us share the similar situation of economic dependence. So this attitude is what caused all that upheaval and belief that the label deplorable somehow means that there is something wrong with us because we are part of the exploited caste. It's our very denial of this collectively that makes our situation worse. Ending with progress being made against caste, let's realize that there is growing awareness about our troubles with unregulated capitalism, corporate greed, corrupt banking, and more. At the same time that more people are becoming poor, poor people are being seen as only partially to blame for suffering in these socioeconomic conditions. Actual action is brewing in the form of the American Anti-Corruption Act or the For the People Act, which has an 87% favorability rating among voters, as well as for calls to restore a nationalized central bank. So these three fault lines of racism, sexism, and caste are human rights issues. They never should have been politicized under our constitution, yet our lawmakers enjoy playing with these issues to their own advantage. And the reason, don't forget, is because we let them. Liberation from the fault lines must occur at the individual level, collectively, before it can occur at the community level. To do so, we have to first have the intention of doing better, and second, we have to work to free ourselves from a few mindsets that do not serve us, namely the view that our value lies only in what we are to an employer. We must replace this hierarchical model of humanity based on employment with one that's based on our equal worth as humans, such as the psychological model of Ma uh, Abraham Maslow that guides us in healing our physical, social, and mental ailments. Washington DC's favorite question, what do you do for a living? This question reinforces the fallacy that our success as human beings are based entirely on our ability to generate income, which ignores the most important impressions that we have on the earth and on each other, like the ways in which we motivate and lift each other up. To become free, we must all unlearn and relearn to evaluate rich and poor alike, men and women alike, brown and pink alike, based on our individual humanity which is judged by the degree to which we exhibit the mental maturity of moving from self-preserving towards self 
self-awareness, self-regulation, self-actualization. To summarize these levels of awareness, self-preserving means that an individual at that moment is consumed by emotional impulses towards egomaniacal urges such as sexual domination and unrequited influence over resources or pride. <clears throat> Self-aware means the being, the individual recognizes that the self has emotions, personal strengths and weaknesses, social standing and influence on the behavior of others. Self-regulation means that uh, the individual is currently effective at controlling emotions, setting personal goals for self-improvement and focusing social interactions on the betterment of self and others. While self-actualized means that a person commits to the value of truth and the pursuit of knowledge and adopt values and behaviors toward the utility of others and not just the self. So our liberation depends on our willingness to overcome our innate desire to dominate others as a way to derive self-esteem. To overcome our unhealthy old-fashioned domination logic, we must improve our understanding of interpersonal power dynamics like this, like, like uh, employment hierarchies. The first rule of interpersonal dynamics is hierarchies are bad. Humans love to create hierarchies, employer over employee, male over female, white over yellow, over red, over brown, over black. These are all false social con constructs. We all have equal worth and equal rights under natural law. So we need to start shifting away from hierarchies and focus on our shared humanity. That shared humanity is that our lives obey a cycle, a life cycle, and that, that, <clears throat> and that involves struggle. We struggle to stay mindful to self-awareness to self-regulation, to self-actualization, until either we suffer sudden death or our body decomposes to the point that we return to an entirely self-preserving animalistic state, fact of life. So, there is no good justification for avoiding difficult truths. I've studied suffering until I found myself an expert in, in it, and then I kept going. Now I'm observing what still possibly might be the downfall of our democracy a global disease bringing death to the democratic experiment, diminishing world peace and the worsening destruction of our globe, all because collectively we are too uncivilized to resist the urge to dominate anything and everything. If we actually wanna help bring world peace, we must start by admitting that the story of humanity is not one of peace or positive vibes, but a sick one. Then we more clearly see ourselves in others and we soon stop comparing ourselves to others and learn to like love ourselves and each other despite our imperfections and past mistakes. That's individual liberation. Our country specifically has gotten really bad about domination over the course of about a hundred years. Uh, and in that hundred years, we've been combating com communism. When we consider forms of government, it's certainly not communism that encompasses cooperation best, it's democracy. So as we invalidate communism, we must remember that cooperation is an essential component of societies. The magic and mutual benefit of sharing with others is the biggest blessing of living. And those who have cultivated their social skills of interpersonal interaction and connection are, ought to be overall happier, but in our non-meritorious world are sadder due to our courageous empathy. Unfortunately, 74 million of us still judge harshly and believe others can never be trusted rather than admit that humans are fallible and still deserving of forgiveness. These unforgiving types think we are in competition with each other, think only of how they can get ahead. During crisis, they parade with signs that say, sacrifice the weak, ignoring that we're all weak, with the weakest being those who try to live by rugged individualism. Illness and injury are the great equalizers, as I've mentioned. They remind us that we cannot take care of ourselves by ourselves. We need somebody, actually more than one someone. Sometimes we experience things in life and need somebody who can drop everything to be physically in our home, not through a phone or via Zoom, to make sure that we get out of bed, out of the house, and accomplish something, anything, each day, and get, you know, get well when we're sick. The good news is that more people have been waking up to that fact that when we help one another, we're better off. 
we are waking to the magic of how each social interaction with another is an opportunity to connect and to influence them in a positive way and create happiness for both parties, thereby increasing the net happiness of the world. Happiness, you see, is not a zero-sum game, meaning it can be created without destroying another person's happiness. The best explanation of community that I have found is by Bell Hooks, who said, beloved community is formed not by the eradication of difference, but by its affirmation, by each of us claiming the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live in the world. So if the if the quality of our community is truly based on affirmation of our differences, one might argue we're certainly getting better because we are recognizing differences, aren't we? <clears throat> women are becoming proud to be women in a woman-hating world. Men are still proud to be men in a newly man-hating world. And the non-binary are proudly non-binary in a world that is starting to recognize them. We all recognize our responsibility to family and whether we actually do so or not, most of us will even admit our responsibility to ourselves so we are in the best situation to take care of our family. But ask a US citizen what their civic responsibility is outside of family, and they usually think of just voting and jury duty. There is so much more to our social contract. If citizens are to realize the benefits of pluralism and create a more beloved community, we must commit to community and civic-minded spirit at many layers, 10 in fact, from the individual level to the partnership of the household or sharership, to the street, town, locality, state, nation, globe, and even the universe. The critical missing pieces to me are the layers of community between local government and the household. The model I promote establishes a layer for street teams, a network of residences supporting each other during difficult times, which help families focus on the sharing of resources like community centers, parks, playgrounds, gyms. Such cooperation was once only theoretical in books like Henry David Thoreau's Walden or B.F. Skinner's Walden II, Ecotopia, Ecotopia Emerging, which led to one about an actual experiment in intentional community titled, Is It Utopia Yet? About a place in Virginia that I actually visited for three weeks. Today, there's tens of thousands of examples that exist in the U.S. alone and can be learned about at www.international, I'm sorry, intentionalcommunities.org. All right, I conclude this talk about our civic spirit, in particular, the human, right, uh, human rights fault lines that plague our communities by emphasizing the underutilized opportunity humanity has to improve human reliability at each of the, the 10 levels that I previously mentioned by doing what I call a look inward and a look outward. And this promotes accountability at each layer and ensures the opportunity to address obstacles through appeal to the next layer from the individual all the way to the United Nations. To facilitate your journey in getting the most civic spirit out of each of the layers in community, I have made available to you free a set of worksheets. The power worksheet aids you in, and your accountability buddy in personal accountability. This level of detail may be anxiety inducing and bad for you if you suffer from perfectionism. Here's the thing, no one is close to perfect at the criteria within. In fact, there's no perfect. Everyone is trying their best. So love yourself when you do your best and when you don't. The love worksheet aids you and your romantic partner in accountability to the relationship. This level of openness may be too detailed and even anxiety inducing for new couples. But eventually healthy relationships advance to this level of communication and understanding of one another. It is not necessarily a sign of a bad relationship if your partner does not wanna discuss some things, but it is generally not a good sign if they skip a lot of the deeper conversations or avoid discussing this worksheet at all. Conversations are by far easier than the life situations that you might face as a couple, like infidelity, major illness, family member loss, death of a child, a child with a developmental disorder, or several of these at the same time. The SHARE worksheet aids you in achieving accountability in your SHARE-ship, household, homestead, commune, whatever you call it. <clears throat> Those in your SHARE-ship may be your kids, your parents, your in-laws, your other dependents, or it may include a handful of partnerships with which you share a common space. Like a life partner, those in your household depend on one another for support in times of sickness, injury, loss of work, loss of will, substance abuse, and other hard times. 
This share worksheet has made its way in front of your eyes so you too can achieve healthy cooperation and the sharing of common spaces and experiences, doing mutual emotional maintenance and healing. And so you have people who care about you all through your life and avoid the sad emotional state of distrust, loneliness, bitterness, and anger. The simple truth is you are caring. You care about others. You care about your belonging in social groups. For this reason, you're worthy of this knowledge. I like to think you were chosen for it and you chose it in return as well by listening to this. The street worksheet aids you to empower nearby individuals and shareships toward accountability and excellence as neighbors on uh, on your shared streets. The street is where the rubber meets the road, as they say. Neighborliness within one street is a layer of community most essential to ensuring trust and therefore best for promoting social cohesion and preventing the shredding of our social fabric. And so it's been what's what we've been missing. Many of us see people on our street as potential robbers or sexual predators, completely overlooking that these neighbors are our first call for aid for our share ships. Granny needs groceries, grass needs cut, dogs need walked, kids need watched, home needs watched while you're away, help moving, help on your car. Neighbors are your on your street are closest proximity, closest emotionally, and therefore most likely to chip in. Knowing, cooperating, and trusting our neighbors is what allows us to send our kids to play outside or know that our elders are safe to make a trip to the store because they have the protection of the whole neighborhood. The town worksheet aids you in achieving accountability of street teams and individuals within your town. The town team concept elevates our local communities from an outreach mindset where information gets to those residents best able to reach for it to an integration mindset whereby residents rise to be truly informed consumers. Currently, our communities operate by a scarcity mindset whereby different demographics compete with one another for county funds and benefits and are forced to play games to help their zip code or their congregation or their ethnicity gain over those nearby. The town team enables cooperation whereby the community can more easily ensure equitable access to the benefits of community and strategize how to best meet their shared needs, whether it's utilities serving the immediate area or affordable foods available via the area co-op. So as we visualize what community can be, we may recognize that some elements of such a community have existed before. We've witnessed remarkable elements at different times, like the Revolutionary War, for instance, when citizens came together in a big way to defeat the ruling caste. It involved a, a grassroots style distributed network of militia and workers with specific roles connected via famous couriers like Sybil Ludington and Paul Revere. Citizens rose together again during our horrendous civil war when brother fought brother and pitted civic responsibility or even over even familial responsibility. In the world wars, women joined the workforce in mass in the name of civic responsibility again. It should be remarkably telling that in times of war and crisis, we turn toward the principles of community, not individualism. There is no reason why we cannot make this cognitive shift without changing our form of government. If anything, this transformation involves further incorporating democratic principles into our shared community. It's common wisdom not to worry about what is outside of our power. Ah, but when we live in a democracy, we must admit that we do have power and we do have responsibility to engage civically, all of us. We are all responsible for our foreign affairs of our country and the impact that we have on the rest of the world too. With power comes responsibility, and that means engaging in every layer of our community, from self and family all the way to national and global activism. Whether we like to admit it or not, there is blood on our hands from our military mistakes. So in summary, our democracy is being tested. Though it is truly us as a people who are being tested, we need to improve our sense of community in each of the 10 layers, from the individual to the universal. When it comes to having civil dialogue with our peers, we need to have a strong back, focus on truth, as well as a soft front, focus on vulnerability. We need to think globally to properly learn from diverse experiences and think plurally to break the apples box, the man box, and the deplorables box. And we need to strategically adopt, adapt our dialogue approaches to individual based on which 
oh, to individuals based on which of the five cultures that they fall into to help de-radicalize the extremists, to help unionize the corporatists, to help educate the capitalists, and to help engage the reluctant, to help support the activists doing the most direct action. Folks, please do some self-care tonight. After the profound introspection and maybe even healing that we just did together. Think intentionally on what thoughts and reactions came up, but also meditate without thinking about anything, but in just being present in the current moment and just exist because that brings peace and restoration. Make sure you do this at least, at least one thing that brings you joy after listening to this talk like food that tastes good, uh, as good as it smells. And I thank you for the honor of joining me in this sacred space and time in this talk. If you found this interesting and want to hear more, subscribe to my newsletter. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram at who is Mark Denome, and find my books for sale on Amazon and Kindle. If you so desire, you can hire me to work with your organization though my, through my website, whoismarkdenome.com or by emailing whoismarkdenome at gmail.com. Feel free to contribute to my efforts via patreon.com slash whoismarkdenome. Every moment of every day, we are leaving an impression of ourselves on this earth and on each other. A better world is possible. I'm asking you to help create it.